Hello, this is part two on methods of ownership. In a previous session, we talked about community property, joint tenancy, severalty, and so on. In this session, we're going to get into some of the lesser known ways of holding title. And the first one is called tenancy by the entireties. Now, as we mentioned in a previous session, Arizona is a community property state, and there are eight total community property states. Well, actually, tenancy by the entireties is not recognized in community property states. It's actually a method of ownership that exists in many other states between husband and wife. So it's actually similar to community property with rights of survivorship in that it's a method of ownership only for husband and wife, and it does have the right of survivorship. But keep in mind, it does not exist here in Arizona but it does exist in quite a few other states. So that's tenancy by the entireties. The other thing we want to talk about here is partnerships and LLCs and so on. So let's first talk about a general partnership. Let's say that you and I acquired a property as tenants in common. Uh, actually, we would be in a form of general partnership. It was just you and me. We would be tenants in common, but each of us would have liability for all of the debts incurred on that particular property. Now, a general partnership is typically put together by one individual who has an idea for development of a property or purchasing an apartment building and fixing it up and so on. And that general partnership is put together and every partner is considered to be what's called a general partner. Well, what does that mean? Well, that each of the partners in that general partnership have full liability for all of the debts of the partnership. So, for example, let's say there were four of us, and I was the one that really spurred this partnership together, but all, all four of us were considered to be general partners. And I collected the rents and paid the bills. Well, maybe I collected the rents, but I didn't pay the bills, and I milked this property until such time as really all the money was gone and my, my foul deed had been discovered. But I'm broke now. And two of the others are broke as well, but you've got the deep pockets. Well, guess what? All of the debts that that general partnership has, you could be held liable for. So general partnerships are pretty rare anymore because of the liability issue related to a general partnership. Now, a more common type of partnership that's used in real estate, although not used nearly as much as it was years ago, is called a limited partnership. And in a limited partnership, we typically have one general partner, maybe two or three, but one general partner. That's the person who puts this transaction together, the investment but goes out and seeks other individuals to invest in that partnership. But the other individuals are what are called limited partners. What does that mean? Well, the limited partners are only liable for the, for the amount of money that they invest in the partnership. By being a limited partner, they cannot be held liable for the debts of the partnership, even if they amount to, to quite a large sum. The general partner in that limited partnership, though, does have full liability for all of the partnership debts. So limited partnerships were very common with commercial investment property back in the uh, early to mid 80s. When the tax law changed in the late 80s, 1980s, that changed as well. And then in the 1990s, what happened was instead of limited partnerships, the laws changed and allowed limited liability companies. So most investment groups that are put together today are limited liability companies, LLCs. That's what LLC stands for, limited liability company. And a limited liability company is not too dissimilar to a, a, an S corporation. We're not gonna get into all these nuances, but a limited liability company is a company formed by uh, a member or two or more members uh, to limit their liability. So many real estate investments today uh, are acquired using limited liability companies. In fact, some of the investors out there actually create a separate LLC 
for each property that they happen to buy and invest in. Why? Because if that property fails, if it turns out not to be a good investment, then in essence they can walk away from that and all they would lose would be the assets of that LLC, which if it's a single entity LLC, that asset is probably valueless. So LLCs have become a, a, the chosen way, so to speak, of investing in real estate with partners. I'm going to use that term loosely here. It's not a partnership, but it is a limited liability company that is created between a group of investors. And one of the things we're not going to get into here and distinguish between the different types of corporations. Uh, corporations are not a preferred way, actually, of investing in real estate. As I mentioned, LLCs have become the preferred method for real estate investors. Now, one of the things that real estate agents have to be careful about is getting involved with the sale of securities. So let's say you happen to have a great idea. There's a property out there you really feel is a winner. So you then go ahead and create this limited liability company and go out and seek other investors uh, to fund this particular purchase of this property. Well, that could be considered to be a security. So you have to be very careful here. And if in the future you ever decide to uh, syndicate a property, put this, uh, this investment together, I would really encourage you to speak with an attorney who understands security issues. Now, securities are also stocks and bonds that you might buy through a brokerage firm. Uh, so whether it's a real estate security uh, a limited, an investment in a limited liability company or investment in a limited partnership on a particular property, or whether it's stocks and bonds, what are called blue sky laws govern the sale of securities. Why do they call them blue sky laws? Because usually in the sale of securities, they, they're, they're selling the blue sky. They're selling the upside to this particular investment. That's where the term blue sky laws come from. And these are enforced by the SEC. That's the federal agency, the Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Which I have to realize as real estate agents that if you get involved in the sale of securities, certainly if you're selling stocks and bonds, you need to have a securities license of some sort. But even as a real estate agent, bringing a group of investors together, it's possible that you might uh, be selling a security which would, which would require registration and a securities license of some sort would be required. So again, if you're ever putting an investment together where you, you're going to be going out and seeking a lot of investors, keep in mind that it could be considered to be a security. Now let's talk about condos and co-ops. Question, that building in that slide, is that a condominium or a co-op or is it simply an apartment building owned by an investor? Well, let's presume it's one or the other, a condo or a co-op. Which one would it be? We don't know. We can't tell. Why? Because condo or co-op is actually a distinction in the form of ownership, not in the physical structure necessarily. So that building could either be a condo or a co-op. So what's the difference? Well, let's take a condo. Let's say we had a four-unit condominium with some grounds and so on. First of all, when a condo is built, actually the common areas are the entire structure. You don't own anything in a condominium except airspace. You own from the paint in. So what we have with a condominium is we have 100% fee simple ownership of the individual unit. And we have, since we have four here, we have common ownership, 25% each in common of the buildings and all of the grounds. So condominiums, again, you own the airspace, but you get 100% ownership of that airspace, of that fee simple interest, and 25% each in common of the common areas. Now, with condominiums, you as the owner get a deed. So you get a deed to your individual unit, and you pay taxes on that individual unit. You pay taxes on the individual unit. And these condominiums can be either residential, by far most commonly they are, or even office condominiums, 
industrial or commercial condominiums. So it doesn't have to be just residential property. Now with condominiums, the governing rules are found in what's called the condominium bylaws. So if you are purchasing or helping someone purchase or sell a condominium, the governing rules are found in the bylaws. And in Arizona, the board of directors of the condominium association are required to meet annually. So every year, the board of directors must meet. Now, they may be more commonly or more frequently, but they have to meet at least annually. And what's known as the open meeting rules have to be followed. So that's a little bit on condominiums. Now let's talk about co-ops. So let's say it's the same four unit property. With a co-op, you get no individual ownership of your living unit. What happens with a co-op is an association is formed. Now it could be a corporation, most commonly is, right? and you get stock in that corporation that owns the whole property. And as part of your ownership interest in that cooperative association, you actually get the right to lease one of the units in that cooperative. All right, so something that we refer to in another session as a proprietary lease. Your lease is called a proprietary lease because you're one of the owners of that co-op and you have the right to lease one of the units in that co-op association. Now, in a co-op, you do not get a separate deed for your unit. You get no deed. The association gets a deed to the property as a whole and you have stock in that association. So your interest is a stock interest and the proprietary lease. In some quiz questions you might see, well, your stock is sold or what you actually transfer is your lease right in that cooperative. So in co-ops, again, no deed to the individual. So who pays the taxes? Well, the, the co-op association gets one tax bill for the entire property and pays the taxes and the insurance on that property. So one tax statement for the entire building. So that concludes our brief session on methods of ownership, part two.